HDSLR Shooter. Brought to you by Akidio, Adamus, Blackmagic Design, Carl Zeiss, JVC, Sennheiser, and Xylite. My name is Benjamin Brown. I was the DP and editor, supervising sound editor, sound designer, and producer on Harbinger Down. The film was a lot, was, uh, overall it was about two years of my life. For a low budget film is pretty nuts to think of that. Um, but it was one of the greatest experiences and a lot of fun. I think we started January 28th, 2014. We shot for 22 days of principle. The whole film took about seven to eight months to do. It actually took, I think, 19 with all the stoppages. We had to stop for this to get built. We had to stop for this to be made. We had to stop for this certain aspect. We had to stop everything to get the film done, to get it to a point to take to AFM to sell. So there was different times where everything would stop just to get something done. Um, but then we'd go back and do some more. So it, it took us about eight months to the entire project. Alec and Tom at ADI had done uh, the Thing prequel, the remake. And they did all these practical effects that were covered up by CG. So they decided to put up some BTS because people were talking some trash about their work. So they put them up and say, look, this is great stuff. Look what we did. And it was covered up. And a lot of the fans got excited. And so they said, wait, we're getting a re great response. Let's, you know, Alex said, let's do a Kickstarter. So he did a Kickstarter. And that's where that whole aspect of this coming off of, look, let's do practical effects. Let's focus on this. Let's really show what we can do. Now, the difference is, is the, you know, there's always budgetary concerns, especially with practical effects. It still is more inexpensive than digital, but there's a limit to what you can do, and normally you get a more substantial budget. So we had a very small budget, and we still pulled off the project. We were the highest grossing, most successful Kickstarter project, sci-fi horror, and then on top of it, we had a donation from a private investor that put us to where we could do the film. Uh, safely. So that's how it all started. And then for the project to go, we really wanted to show practical effects. We really wanted to show how things could be done. Um, because of our budget, we couldn't, we couldn't do certain things. We couldn't, get a, we couldn't even get a soundstage. Uh, we didn't have enough money to, buy, to rent a soundstage to shoot because it would take us time to build and do all that. So we came up with the idea of renting a warehouse and we built the entire ship inside the warehouse. And then that's how the whole thing went. So we had four months in a warehouse, two months for the build, one month for the shoot, one month for tear down. This was my first feature as a DP, yes. Um, it, was, it was kind of mind blowing for somebody like Alec who has the incredible credentials that he has. He had a lot of people call him and actually offer, um, but luckily I, I, the two of us really clicked when we did the Kickstarter, uh, the, the video for that and the trailer. So that opened up the door for me to work with him. And I think he also knew I worked cheap. I think that's the other reason. And if you know Alec, that 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 helps a lot. Um, but I th he also likes the fact that I do, because I could help him through the post-production and supervise and help out with that, that opened a lot of doors. The stress alone of working on Alec's directorial debut with his name involved and all the other people that are attached to it, um, you know, I, I sat back one time, and one of, one of my favorite movies is Battle Beyond the Stars, Roger Corman. It's, it's not fabulous by any stretch of the matter, but I love it because when I was growing up, I watched it with my family, and it brings back great memories. Um, when I, you know, that was Alex's first feature film he worked on. Pat McClung worked on that. Robert Skotak worked on it. Denny Skotak. And I'm working with all these guys on this film, and I'm literally standing with them, and I'm looking around going, okay, this is the coolest day of my life. So, yeah, it was stressful thinking that, that's what it is, but this, at the same time you stop and go, okay, I got hired, he thinks I can do it, so I have to do it. It's not a matter of me going, well, I don't have an option, it's you have to do it. You got hired for a job. And, and so, but the big gamble again was choosing the camera that I did. And I, I, when you love the image, you make whatever you can work. And I, I remember people, first, when it first came out, the 2.5K, the, the, the huge backlash of this workflow. Oh my God, this workflow. Everyone just kept saying that. And I kept going, I, I, I don't expect my workflow to be what I say it is. I expect what I want is the end image. If the end image is this, then I will figure out the workflow to get to that image. So I just shot with the camera. I did tons of tests. And once I got the feel of it, I knew, 
Okay, now let's go backwards and figure out how to make it work quicker to get to that point. And what can I do to show people that? So once you see the image, everything goes backwards, in my opinion. Other people may disagree, and that's fine. But for me, that's how I did it. Wow, I love the way this looks. I'm going to make my workflow fit that image. And so when I had Alec, and I ha when I really made Alec happy with what he was seeing, that that made a big deal. The big thing was I decided I wanted to shoot in the two and a half K. I love the filmic look of it. I think it has a very interesting and beautiful quality about it. Um, Alec though talked to other people and the other people told him that's not a professional camera. Everyone's saying you gotta shoot in the Epic, you gotta shoot in the Epic, you gotta shoot in the Epic. And I said, well, if I'm gonna shoot on anything outside, I, I said, I'll possibly do the Sony F55. I was looking at that as, as a possibility. Uh, and then I really did some time with the camera test on the on the on the two and a half K, and I just loved it. What I did was I a lot of the tests were with the uh, special effects guy Frank Balzer. He would come in and do some stuff. At ADI they have a huge warehouse where they do their stuff. They have a showroom up front, and they have a machine shop on the side. So at night I would cover up the windows and smoke it up and do some light tests and things like that just to see how things would work, and if it would and if the image was what I wanted. But it also helped for me to show Alec and say, look at this, it's beautiful. And that's how I sold him was on those camera tests. He would see it, Pat McClung would see it, and they're like, I mean, they've worked on huge films. I mean, they all, they're all Oscar winners. They all looked at him and was like, this is amazing. So, you know, what justification do I have for using something else when you love the image of it? It has a gorgeous filmic quality. It, for me, it was a no-brainer. I said, this is the one I want. And so then, but the best part was, Alec didn't just say, no, we're shooting this. He let me prove to him, this is, look at this. And then when he saw it, he goes, I love the way this looks. And that opened up the door for so many other things. We used the 2.5K for principal and visual effects. We used the 4K for elements. We used the Ursa for elements. And we used the Pocket for elements. So within the film, you'll see all four of the cameras they offered at the time we did the film. When the creature comes out of the deck, it was a shot that the creature, because the creature is coming out, of, we're looking over the shoulder of Sadie and we, we had to comp in the creature, it was a miniature, coming up and then tentacles coming out of its mouth. But so we had a wall of the ship, the back wall. So the creature came up, so here's the back wall, the creature comes up and then belches forth the, the tentacles. So we ended up having to do that shot because the tentacles needed gravity, we did the shot upside down. And then because we had to have the wall come out at a certain time, raise. We did it upside down in reverse. So the creature couldn't move because of the puppeteer. So we had somebody pull the tentacles up and we had the wall move down. So we did the entire shot in reverse and upside down, which we shot in the Ursa, which was great. Um, that 10 inch viewfinder, you know, when I first saw it, you think, what the hell would you use that for? But then, you know, after you shoot a little bit with, you're like, how will I ever shoot without a 10 inch viewfinder? It's kind of a weird uh, setup because you laugh at it at the beginning and you realize, man, this is really cool. Um, so we use that a lot. And so when we do playback, I would just flip the camera upside down and we'd hit playback. That's also something that's great about these cameras. Playback, forward two, four, eight times, backwards two, four, eight times, which is great for visual effects work. Um, and then, you know, being able to flip the camera upside down with that viewfinder, you have four or five people that can watch it. Didn't have that opportunity with the Sony or the Odyssey. It didn't play in reverse. It may now, but at the time it didn't play in reverse. So what we would do is we do the coolest ghetto setup ever. I'd pull out my two and a half K. We would play back on the Odyssey and I'd record on the two and a half K and then we could watch it in reverse on the two and a half K's monitor, which, uh, was kind of a fun little, it was a ghetto setup, but it was kind of fun to put together when everyone's going, man, we can't do this. How we can't see it in reverse. I'm like, doesn't play back, guys. Well, I've got a camera that does. So we just did that instead. Most stuff was shot at 48. Very rarely did we go above 60. The only thing I shot over 60 was the boat crash. We shot that at 120. Two shots. As the boat's coming in, actually from this as a camera's, as the boat's coming in to hit the ice chunk, this spray, we shot that at 120. And the mount as the boat, as you're doing the POV, going into the ice chunk, those two shots were only two we shot above 60. I'm not a small guy. And Alec really wanted up angles. He, loves, he loved Alien 3. He really loves Alien 3. And he said, let's get the up angle. So I was on the ground most of the time. We shot handheld. I think I used the sticks for probably 10% of the film. There's a few scenes where there's some you know, talking going on. We were in sticks, but most of it was handheld. 
and I was, the camera level was about 32 inches off the ground. And I just put my hand on the bottom, grabbed the lens and pulled my own, operated. Alec wanted to have a few microscope shots for them to do research, so they're looking in, so we have to be able to fake that image, which is basically an image that, they're, that is showing up on their highly fascinating digital microscopes that puts it onto the Surface tablet next to it. So what we did was we, he sculpted the morphed tardigrades. We mounted it up high enough that the puppeteers could get underneath and work all the bodies and all the tentacles. I put a piece of, another piece of white styrene on the ground I took two 1Ks and bounced it up in and put two 1Ks aimed directly in so it got a flat even across it. Then we got up on a uh, stair, a uh, portable, a movable stairway, and we mounted the camera out across and down, strapped the, the tripod on and aimed straight down onto that uh, so that you could see it. And then within the post-production, the, the DI took that image pitched it pink, and then I told him, I said, I want this to be a very shallow depth. I want it to be very macro, like a, like, a, like a microscope would. And so then he took that and put a little bit of the chromatic aberration and made that really tight, shallow depth of field on top of the already cool image. He did that on top of it. And that just, it just took it to that next level. And then I put the layer on top that shows the temperature and all the magnifications and after effects on top of what he already did. When we did the premiere, we did the premiere at the Egyptian theater. If you get a chance to do a premiere or a screening, I highly recommend the Egyptian because they, they calibrate stuff, they tune stuff, they care about what it looks and sounds like. I went there for the tech screening and we went through about 20 minutes of the footage and I looked at him and I said, so what do you think, man? And he looked right at me and said, did you shoot on film? And I went, dude, you just made my day. I mean, seriously, are you serious? And he goes, yeah, I thought, I thought you guys shot on film. And I went, here's a guy who watched the 70 millimeter you know, dailies of Interstellar and all these... They, they're one of the few places in LA that can actually show that stuff. He's seen, st he's worked with all different formats. And he says, hey, did you shoot on a film? I said, no, I shot on a $2,000 camera. And he went, what? And then he, he had never seen black magic footage. He knew of the camera, but he had never seen it, especially blown up on his screen. And so I said, well, what do you think? And he said, this is, this is amazing. So for somebody that deep into it, who's worked with everything from film, 70 millimeter, 35, digital, and for him to say that it looked like that, I mean, that... I don't think we could get a better compliment, really. Uh, HarbingerDown.com. There's also a Facebook, Harbinger Down Official. I have my website. It's AudioWorks.com, but it's spelled like Odd Couple. O-D-D-I-O Works.com. Um, you can always contact me through there. Uh, also for uh, StudioADI.com. They have a whole YouTube channel with a ton of behind-the-scenes creature effects videos and also some of the... Uh, very soon, the BTS videos will be up there, I believe, also from Harbinger. HDSLR Shooter, brought to you by Akidio, Adamus, Blackmagic Design, Carl Zeiss, JVC, Sennheiser, and Xylite.